Damn, man. It's your boy Tony, man. Once more, once again, on that hit show, man. Doing this thing. It's time to take things up another notch. It's time to take things to the next level. If you haven't already subscribed to the hit show, man, we're known for interviewing, you know, Mexican mafia members, Muestra Familia members, Aryan Brotherhood, Pina, Nazi Lowrider, Sureño, Norteño, Female Killers, All Lifers. This is what we dedicate ourselves to on this show. So if you haven't already subscribed, man, I strongly encourage you to do so. With that being said, man, we're going to dive deep into this man's life. Jeremy Beasley, also known as Zap, you know, former Aryan Brotherhood, man. It's going to get deep. It's going to get scary. You guys about to listen to some things that you've never, ever heard before. With that being said, man, hit that like button for your boy Tony Grinding Hard, bringing those exclusives. You know what I'm saying? Let me share that one more time. Hit that like for your boy. Let's do this thing. So where did they call you? Excuse me? So where But I go by Jeremy now. Where are you incarcerated for and how long is your sentence? So I'm incarcerated for first degree murder and I have been incarcerated since 1993. Where are you from out here on the streets? I grew up in Elk Grove, California. Do you or did you the the groups organizations? Yes, I was a member of the Nazi Lowrider prison gang, and then I was recruited into the Aryan Brotherhood, in which I became a member. I grew up so I grew up in a in a normal household. Um, you know, I had uh, a mother, a father. I had two sisters, and. Uh, and I, normal, but, I'm, but and what I mean by normal is we were we always had dinner on the table. Um, my parents worked, um, and you know, but I never really fitted in. And I would look around, and and it was it's hard to explain how I could be part of a family but not part of a family. Um, and I know it kind of sounds a little crazy, but in one breath I'm saying it's normal, another breath I'm saying it doesn't, I don't fit in. But on the house, uh, looking outside, looking in, it was like a normal family. Um, when I was 13, I found out that I was adopted. And that changed my view on how I seen everything. Um, my, my father, or my stepfather, um, told me uh, he got pissed off at me one day, and he threw it in my face and said, uh, no son of mine would be that dumb, that stupid. That's why... Uh, that's why uh, you, your father left you. Um, and I remember running inside the house and asking my mom, uh, who was my bio biological mother, uh, "Hey, is this true? Uh, you know, was I am I adopted?" And she looks to my my dad and says, uh, "Hey, Hal, we promised we would never tell him." Well, right then and there, it validated every feeling that I've had. It validated everything that I believed. And. I never thought I was good enough. I uh, had a hard time making friends. And so I gravitated towards the wrong crowd. And my name of the wrong crowd was um, I, gravitated, I gravitated towards the stoners, um, the rockers. Uh, you know, uh, I'm 49 years old, so I grew up in the 80s. So that's the kind of uh, the crowd that I, that I ran with. Um, my parents ended up getting divorced a couple of years later. And... I was pissed off at my mother, so I went with my father, who wasn't, again, he was my bio biological father. And I hated my mother for not telling me. I hated her for my, the way that I felt, and I had nothing to do with her. And we, him and I, we moved around from, we went from Sacramento to Washington State, back to Sacramento, uh, moved all over Sacramento. I ended, up, we, I ended up moving so many times that I ended up dropping out of high school and that was in the 10th grade. We eventually ended up in Utah, where him and I uh, got in a big argument, and I was, let me see, I just I just turned 17, uh, so it was uh, in January. He put me on a Greyhound bus and sent me back to California. 
with no more. I think I had maybe 15 bucks in my pocket. So he sent me back to California to live with a friend of mine. And I was living with a friend of mine and out in the in the kind of in the in the rural area of Sacramento. And I was stuck out there. I wasn't going to school. I was working on their little ranch. Uh wasn't doing nothing. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And one day, um a old friend of my father's contacted me and said, Hey, you know, if if you ever need anything let me know. So I kinda moved out there with her. She lives in Rancho Cordova and got a job at Pizza Hut. Uh, uh I was doing good and I was actually uh I was actually uh, uh I mean I was seventeen years old, um going to I mean, I had a job and I kinda had plans in life. Well, uh everything kinda changed one day when uh there was an older kid, he was twenty one, twenty two he just came out of YA, and I liked him. You know, I mean, we used to hang around. He was 17. He was, you know, I was 17. He was 21, 22, and he'd buy me, you know, beer, and we'd go out, we'd drink, and kind of kick it, and I kind of looked up to this guy. And one day, we were driving around, and he pulls up behind this business, this, uh, and uh, he goes, hey, I'm, I'm, we're going to rob it. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. And he goes, nah, man, check it out. We're going to throw a rock to the plate grass window. And if no cops come, we're going to run in and take whatever we can, and I'll split it with you. And I'm sitting there in the car going, dude, I don't want to do this shit. I mean, that's, I don't want nothing to do with this. So next thing I know, he gets out, goes over, smashes the window, runs back to the car. We wait about 10, 15 minutes. Um, he runs in, starts grabbing a bunch of stuff. I just wait at the car, and I didn't want nothing to do with this. So he comes back out, and he's like, hey, open the door, open the door. So I open the door up. I help him put the shit in the car. We go back to his apartment. And he goes, hey, half of this is yours. I'm like, nah, I'm, I'm good, dude. I'm, hey, I'm, I'm good. And so I go to work, and a couple days later, uh, someone comes and tells me the cops are looking for me for that, for that burglary. And so I tell my boss, hey, I quit. And I go out the back door when the cops are coming in the front door, and I was on the run. Well, my girlfriend at the time ends up turning me in, and so I get arrested. Um, this is just before my 18th birthday, and I don't have – my dad's in Utah. My mother, I don't know where she's at. Um, I think at that time she was in a mental institution, uh, and so I had nobody. So the lady that I was staying with came and got me out of uh, juvenile hall and ended up adopting me. Uh, so I was, a, I was a ward of the state. So she ended up adopting me, and I was living with her and uh, trying to find other jobs. I was doing odd and end jobs. Well, a friend of mine comes over one day and tells me about this drug called Speed. And, I mean, at this time, I mean, I smoked a little bit of weed every now and then and drank the beer, but I wasn't a, I wasn't a drug addict. I didn't do drugs. So he lines me up a uh, nice little fat line and, in the bathroom. And so I do a line, he does a line, and I was like, oh, shit, this shit's pretty good right here. So we go out and we have we party, and, you know, this is on a Friday night, and I got to go to work on, you know, on Monday. So I'm feeling like shit, so I go to work, and next Friday we do it all over again. And for, I don't know, for a month or so, it was just a casual kind of thing. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Then pretty soon I... It started, you know, I needed a little bit before I went to work to stay awake because I was up all weekend. And back then, minimum wage was only 4.25 an hour, and I think I was only making a, a few, a few bucks above that, if any. And I couldn't afford it, so I had this bright idea that I thought no one ever thought of, was, you know what, I'll buy a 16th or eight ball, and break it up and sell it, and I'll have free dope and make a little bit of money and get, you know. And get high. Well, that's when I became a drug dealer, and uh, I started selling started selling dope. And then pretty soon, I would use more than 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 I would sell, and so I would have to re up more come in my pocket. I lost my job, um, and I found it was easier just to rob the uh, the connections. So I would find uh, weak connections. Um, nobody with any kind of power or any that, you know, they had the balls to do anything. I would find the guys that, 
uh, they were weak, and I would take their shit. And one of the guys one time uh, called the cops on me and told them I stole his car. Didn't tell them I stole his dope, but they told them I stole his car. And so I ended up getting arrested uh, for a grand theft auto, for robbery, and got eight months county time. And this was my first time in county jail. And they put me in what they call the branch, which is a, it's like a level one. It's, it's, it's once you get sentenced to county time, they had a, you know, like a little tiny barbed wire fence around the, like a cattle fence around the whole facility, and that was pretty much it. And I remember getting there, and it was, uh, I learned there that violence is a currency in this environment. I learned that uh, it, it, violence is a currency that, that's traded, that's paid for. It is, um, the more violence you are, the more respect you get. Um, and so it was around this time that the, the racial belief systems started coming into play. Um, when I was on, on the outside, I had black friends. I didn't care if you're black, Mexican. I seen everybody the same. You know, um, did I, ha I have my biases? Absolutely. Um, you know, I would stereotype different people, uh, whether they were black or rednecks or, or Chinese or Mexican or whatever they were. I, you know, I stereotyped them. But until the, 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 the racism, the racial stuff beliefs came in once I came to county jail, and I, it was kind of like an indoctrination. Um, one of the first things is, as a white uh as a white man is, we're told is that we don't associate with the blacks, we don't associate with the Mexicans, um, we stick with our own race. Anybody seen talking to the other races is suspect. And what I mean suspect is uh, they can't be trusted and they usually are victim, uh, victimized at some point. So, I, so I'm in county jail and I get in a couple fights there and, and um, you know, I'm scared to death. I mean, I'm in county jail with these dudes and I don't think I'm a criminal. I didn't think I was a criminal at all. I just thought I was a kid and trying to come up on selling a little bit of dope. So I get out of jail, and I don't have nothing. I don't have a pot to piss in. Um, so the people that I was staying with threw away all my clothes, all my property. I get released from jail with, with the clothes on my back, and that's it. So a friend of mine let me sleep on the couch. And um, I'm sleeping on the couch, and... I don't have nothing, and so I end up going stealing the truck, and so I justified this to myself, saying, "Hey, I'm gonna steal this truck, and go and uh, and use it to find a job, get a job, and get a, and become legit." And then I justified, "Hey, you know what? I'm just gonna do a little bit of dope and sell a little bit of dope, so I have some money, so I can buy some clothes and some tools, so that I can get a job and become legit." Well. That all turned into me working for a guy. Uh, he was, so I was at a connect house, and there was a guy there that was burning him. And I, I, I watched the whole situation, said he couldn't pay him. Um, he you had 60 seconds remaining. Um, I'm at this connect house, and, uh, and I'm watching him get burnt for this guy's talking shit and burning them and, and making an excuse why you can't pay him. And so I, I kind of jumped in and, and I, you know, jammed dude up. And uh, I tell him, hey, you're going to pay this dude, you know what I mean? And I did it forcefully. I did it, um, I did it violently. I did it from what I learned in, in prison or in jail. And the dude got all scared um, because one of the things that I learned in one of the things that I learned in county jail was that guys will guys will blow up, guys will uh, look tough, but most of them back down if someone uh, talks back to them. I learned uh, what I learned in county jail was that uh, most guys are are afraid and they put on a face or a mask. That um, you know, don't get me wrong, there's killers and there's some tough you know motherfuckers in you know in prison and in jail. But most guys just they, they wear a mask, and so uh, I pretended to be one of them tough guys, and this guy folded, and he ended up pulling out some money out of his pocket and, and paying Lee, and uh, and 
you know, he he leaves. And I remember Lee telling me, oh, man, I, man, I appreciate that. That dude's been, you know, ducking me for, for weeks. I say, no problem. So he gives me a big old sack of dope. And I was like, oh, shit. He goes, hey, you want to make some money, um, you can work for me. And This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And go and collect, you know, drop off dope for me, collect some money and everything else. And I was like, hell yeah. So I remember him, he gave me a motorcycle. Um, he gave me a, uh, uh, you know, he gave me dope. He gave me a place to stay. And so I kind of looked at this dude as a father figure. I kind of looked at this dude like, you know what? Um, you know, this is kind of cool right here. But it was also, at, it, it was around this time where I adopted uh, an all or nothing mentality. I wanted everything or nothing. Um, I didn't want... It was just uh, either you were with me or you're against me kind of kind of mentality. And uh, so, anyways, you know, I would go around, uh, drop off dope, pick up money, and most of the time it was easy. Most of the time it it was nothing to it. Um, sometimes I'd have to get forceful. Sometimes I'd have to, you know, uh, kick in the door or, or you know break a few things in the house, and people would always come up with something. And this is what led me to murdering my first victim. Uh, me and a, another guy went to uh, my victim's house because he owed uh, some money to, to Lee. And we walked in, and I put a gun to his head, forced him on his knees, and told him I was going to collect on a, on a drug debt. And he uh, told me he'd already paid or gave me some gave me some excuses. And I told him, man, you're full of shit. I know you got dope in the house. And... At this point, I was a raving dope fiend. Um, methamphetamine, I don't know how much you know about methamphetamine and what it does to people, but it made me feel like I was 10 feet tall, bulletproof. It turned off my uh, my empathy uh, switch in my head. It turned off my humanity, um, everything. So imagine, imagine that. So um, I get him up from his knees, take him into his bedroom, and he starts, you know, he hands me a little bag of dope, and I'm now I'm pissed, thinking he's holding out. Well, he tells me he has some more over around the corner, so we walk around the corner, and I felt this dude just kept disrespecting me, and I ended up uh, shooting him in his head, and walked out the house, got in the truck, and um, my co-defendant and I drove off. Well, he uh, take, takes me back over to the Connects house, to Lee's house. Uh, leaves. I, I left the gun in the truck, so I call him and tell him, hey, you know, I left the gun in the truck, I'm going to come pick it up because I'm going to get rid of it. Well, when I show up, he's already got rid of the, got rid of the gun. He, well, he sold it for dope. The guy he sold it to was a, uh, was a, was a gun dealer for the Hells Angels. The, he sold it to a Hells Angels by the name of Gary Pendleton or Reno. And Reno took the gun because he recognized it as mine and thought that I was going to come for him next. So he took it to the sheriff's and turned it in for credit on a future crime. And I had all all this was in my police report. So this is nothing that, like I said, anything I tell you can be verified very easily. So uh, now the cops know that I, uh, I was the one that murdered uh, my victim. So a couple of days later, uh, about a week or so later, I ended up getting arrested in the drive-thru of, of uh, McDonald's. Well, I get to jail, my, me and my co-defendant. They uh, came with a offer that a uh, manslaughter for me and my co-defendant. I would have to do 18 years. My co-defendant would have to do three or six, I think it was. And he ended up turning evidence against me. And they took the deal off the table and gave me another deal of 25 years to life. So my lawyer says, uh, hey, I would recommend you take this deal. And so I asked him. I, I still remember this day. I asked him, I go, hey, if I was your kid, what would you, what would you have me do? So at this point, I'm uh, 21. I think I just turned 21 in, in county jail. He said, if you were my kid, I would tell you to take this deal because you have a chance to go home in 12 and a half years. Well, I thought that 25 to life meant that I could get out of prison in 12 and a half years. This was in 1993, 94. Um, and so I take the deal, 
and everyone around me is telling me, don't take the deal, don't take the deal, you're stupid. And I'm not listening to them, these dudes. These dudes, you know, I'm, I'm thinking they're all idiots and they're dumb. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Well, I ended up taking the deal, coming to uh, state prison, and I met, Trace, I met Tracy. And now, I don't know if you've ever been, seen pictures of Tracy, but when I walked in, it was it looked like a prison. And I'm not going to lie to you, I was scared shitless. I walked in here, you know, I'm surrounded by, you know, granted, hey, I'm out there, I'm out there beating people, I'm out there, um, you know, selling dope, I've, I've assaulted people, um, I had just murdered a man, you know, and when I get to prison, um, I'm scared to death thinking that I'm surrounded by murderers and, and violent, you know, people because I did not consider myself one of them. I didn't see myself as one of these people. Um, I see myself as misunderstood, and I made every excuse I had for not recognizing who I was. So I get into prison, and I'm seeing all these dudes with tattoos and everything, and uh, some of the homeboys, uh, sacramaniacs, come up to me and say, hey, what's up, homeboy, how are you doing? You know, and I'm like, hey, I'm just here to do my time. I'm just here just to, just to kick it, you know? And a couple guys were telling me, hey, look, you know, don't tell no one I told you this, but what you want to do is you want to go to CMC, uh, California Men's Colony. That's a kickback place. You know, don't get involved in politics. I still remember a couple guys telling me that. And I was like, cool, I, I appreciate that. Well, I'm at, so the first time I'm there on the, I'm on the, I don't know, but I'm there about a couple weeks. I'm on the yard, and three dudes approach me on the yard. And one of them tells me, he goes, hey, man, that dude you killed, uh, hey, that was my that was my friend right there. Hey, checks out, man. You know what I mean? If I see you, I'm going to put you in the ground. Is that clear? So I'm sitting here, and I'm looking at the dude, and, again, I'm scared shitless, right? So I'm looking, and there's three dudes, and I know I can't take all three dudes. Um, there's a gun tower right there above us, and I'm thinking, yeah, whatever, man, whatever. Just trying to get out of the situation. Well, I get back to my cell, and I'm thinking, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? And so every prison movie that you can think of comes in my mind. Okay, this is what I need to do. Well, I'm working in the kitchen, and one of the dudes was in the kitchen with me. So I ended up uh, threatening them with a uh, meat thermometer and told them, hey, check out, man. If you ever come up with me again like that again, I'm going to stick this in your fucking neck. Well, the dude said, hey, I, he tells me, hey, that was my buddy right there. I don't know. I don't know nothing. He just wanted me to come, come with him. I don't want no problems. And, again, I noticed how this dude just kind of kind of backed down. Um, and I was like, okay, cool, whatever. You know what I mean? Just stay the fuck away from me. Well, he ends up locking up. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. He was one of the first confidential uh, that I had in prison. So he locks up. I end up, from there, I end up, from Tracy, I end up transferring to... Uh, Calipatria, and I seen the second guy there at Calipatria. When he sees me at, uh, he's in pill line, and I walk by and I recognize him. Well, that day he ends up locking up. That's my second confidential. And I found all this about when I when I did uh, when I when I debriefed. Uh, they talked about all this stuff right here. So I'm at Calipatria, and uh, I want a program. They, I'm from Sacramento. They send me all the way down there to the Arizona-Mexican border. So I show up in Calipatria, and I go to committee, and I tell them, hey, look, I, I don't want to be here. I still got friends. I got family. I got people up north. Um, I I don't want to be here. And they tell me, you know what? You show us that you want to transfer. Give us a year clean, and we'll send you back up north. And I'm like, you promise? And they said, look, we promise. Well, I believed everything they said. You know, at the time, I, you know, why would the officers lie to me? Um, you know, so everyone's telling me they're full of shit. Um, everyone's telling me that, you know, you can't trust a cop. And I'm thinking, nah, they're, these dudes are just criminals. I'm not a criminal. Um, these dudes are the, they're not, they, they don't, they don't get it. So for the first year, I go to school. I go to mass every Sunday. I mind my own business. And I'm sitting back and I'm watching what goes on, and I I just see scandalous shit. I see dudes dropping off their canteen at you know um, other people's houses and they come ask for a soup. 
or some tobacco. And I asked my cellie one time, I go, what's all that about? He goes, that's the Connects house. He goes, they just dropped off the canteen here, and now this dude's going to go around and, and hustle up uh, food for the month. And so I would sit back and I would watch just what dope and stuff does in prison. I'm like, damn, this is crazy right here. This dude, you know, spending, you know, back then it was 120 a month was a full draw. He spent 120 bucks a month and dropping it all off at the at the Connects house. And so uh, he, a year goes by. And, again, people coming up, you know, trying to ask me to put work in, and I'm telling them no on my, my own business. Um, didn't really have a whole lot of friends. Uh, didn't really talk to too many people. I just mind my own business. And when anybody came up and asked me for something, I told them no. Um, hey, we need you. To, uh, I'm good. No. So I end up uh, going to committee. And when I go to committee, they tell me, you know, and granted, during this whole time, I was treated like shit by my own people, the whites. I didn't fuck with the blacks. I didn't fuck with the Mexicans. Um, and the cops treated me like shit because I was a programmer. You know, so think about how lonely that was. Um, the, you know, I had very little friends. Um, my own people, I had no backing from my own people. I couldn't go to any other races because I'm white. And the cops treated me like shit. So I go to committee after a year, and they say, hey, how'd you, you haven't been in trouble. How'd you, how'd you stay out of trouble? You know, uh, guys like you that come in always seem to get in trouble. I said, look, I, I, I told you I want to go back up north. I, you know, I, I want to get out of prison. And this whole time, everyone telling me, dude, you're not getting out of prison. Lifers don't get out of prison. And I'm like, you guys, don't, you guys don't understand. My lawyer told me I was going to get out. And he said, dude, you're never going to get out of prison. But I still had this hope. And uh, so I go to committee, and they say, you know what? Hey, we applaud you. You did, you know, you did good. We're going to do you a favor and send you to the Hatchapi. I don't want to go to the Hatchapi. Hatchapi is one of those PC joints. I'm, I don't want to go there. And they said, you know what? That's, you know, we're going to. I go, look, I don't want to go to the Hatchapi. They go, well, we're going to do you this favor. So now everything's like, hold on a second here. Nobody gets out of prison. Everybody that went to. You have 60 seconds remaining. Everybody that's been aboard has been denied. You know what I mean? Let me call you back. Uh, 